thank you all for being here. I just want to say I live on Wadi Wadi country from the Darawal Nation and I pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land because it always was and it always will be Aboriginal land. And um, as Anna was saying, I'm a practising artist, so as I speak, I've got some pictures of work that I've done that really sort of address some of the issues. And I must say, some of this feels very simplified, so I'm sorry if I'm sort of teaching you to suck eggs. So I've witnessed violence and discrimination against women on the basis of their sex class, where sex is defined by the United Nations as the physical and biological characteristics that distinguish males from females. The rights of women as set out in the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women are both sex-based. Sex and gender are not interchangeable terms. Sex is biological and unchangeable. Every cell in a human body is sex. Gender is a social construct that uses stereotypes divided into masculine and feminine, feminine binaries to control populations. And these gender stereotypes manifest differently across the globe. Gender identity attempts to make these socially constructed stereotypes into essential and innate conditions, and this undermines women's sex-based rights. This art piece is called What Value a Stitch, and it's about the gender pay gap of 18.8%. So 18.8% is missing from the fingers and the gloves and the dollar coin, and the words on the beads between the hands say a long way from revolution. So after listening to women's descriptions of what's happened to them over 45 years, it's clear to me that rape, abuse and violence are tools of the patriarchy used to control women on the basis of their sex, and the state is complicit in these acts against the human rights of women. And I represent that in this watercolour on the right by the Australian Commonwealth coat of arms covering the eyes of the female formed land. My experience has shown me that the tactics of the trans rights activists are similar to the tactics of the male perpetrators of abuse and of men's rights activists. I want to acknowledge that lesbians have been bearing the brunt of this war for the past 30 years. I was active with COAL, as was said, and the Coalition of Activist Lesbians has UN status, um, ECOSOC status, and was active working in the human rights of lesbians as in same-sex attraction between women which is called in CEDAW sexual orientation. So I've worked as a lesbian health worker in two women's health centres in New South Wales, and I've heard many stories of violence and dis discrimination based on their lesbian lives. Lesbians have been colonised by the alphabet soup. We were not consulted, nor did we consent to being bound to gender identity ideology. Men claim they can be lesbians by saying their gender identity is female and that that is more important than biology. They're saying a lesbian can have a penis. They insist lesbian sex can include male genitalia. And this undermines the sex-based rights of lesbians and is a form of sexual coercion. So including men in the definitions of women leads to the destruction of lesbian culture. And that's a culture that's been built over decades through, through women-only spaces, music, art, discussions and social activities. And gender identity politics claims males should have access to lesbian spaces if they say that they're women. So trans rights activists are trying to redefine what a lesbian is and they're demanding that we agree with them. It's a form of cultural genocide for lesbians. Due to collisions with the trans rights activists, most of the lesbian spaces in Australia have gone, including the Sydney Lesbian Space Project, which was a, a cultural centre, the, a two-storey building which has been sold and split our once vibrant lesbian community. The annual national lesbian festivals are now not possible because trans-identified males sued lesbians via the state anti-discrimination tribunals. Sydney Lesbian Open House has stopped running after a trans-identified male physically assaulted a lesbian outside the gathering, intimidating other lesbians from attending. Whatever happened to freedom of association? The rainbow mob spread lies and misinformation, including that you can change your sex, telling young gender non-conforming lesbians that they're really men, lying about radical feminists and accusing us of hate speech and violence. Young lesbians are denied seeing lesbians living lives free of men. The rights of the child are being ignored, while the trans rights activists use transing kids in an attempt to legitimise their unproven assertion that gender is innate. The use of drugs and surgery on children is permanent and harmful. There is evidence that without intervention, most of these young people would grow up to be happy in their bodies as lesbians and gay men. I find it criminal and bewildering that our child protection agencies are not questioning this doctrine. 
Counting Dead Women, these, these are a series of installations that highlight the murders of women by their violent partners in Australia. There's a cutout shape and a cutout space for each murdered woman in a separate book for each year. This one on the left included a magnifying glass displaying the graph of the diminishing numbers of women's refuges in New South Wales from over 80 down to a handful of specialist services in just three years. So I train workers in appropriate responding to women experiencing violence and abuse. And the tactics of abuse from the trans rights activists are the same ones used to control women in their personal relationships. And I'll quickly run through some of them. That's physical and sexual violence, threats and intimidation, verbal violence, gaslighting, threats of suicide, financial and coercive control, minimising and blaming the victim and using children. I've seen trans identified males housed in women's refuges, given a villa to themselves, while women with children who are escaping male violence are being advised to sleep in their cars under the bridge. Many trans-identified males have heightened sexual responses that pose serious risks to the women and children staying at the shelters. And in the UK recently, a trans-identified male in a women's refuge murdered another resident, a woman staying there to be safe and protected from male violence. Heads in the Sand uses the Australian crest of the emu and kangaroo upside down, minus heads, to represent our government's inaction on women's rights to safety. And a bit like what Eileen was talking about, accurate data on violence is really important for the planning of interventions, laws and services for both perpetrators and victims. So counting gender identity instead of sex falsely inflates the rates of female violence and masks the true rates of male violence. So what can we do to resist? So I think it's similar advice to that that we give women experiencing violence or trying to escape male violence. We need to name the perps and their tactics identify our allies and our enemies, speak up when it's safe, use evidence-based research, document everything, use the law where we can, don't engage with them and pick our battles. Because just as these murders act as a threat to all women, so are the actions of the trans rights activists when they conflict and confuse the sex and gender. I speak this evening um, on land stolen from the Wangal clan that's uh, Sydney, Australia, which bore the brunt of the British invasion in 1788. Uh, and I acknowledge that this was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. I have been doing some work for WOROC. I'm the only person who uses that acronym, the Women's Human Rights Campaign, which as people at this seminar probably know is uh, based on the Declaration of Women's Sex-Based Human Rights. Um, specifically, the, what I've been delving in recently is the, um, the upcoming Australian census. We are going to have a census on the 10th of August this year. Now, the declaration stresses the importance of the collection of sex disaggregated data. The points made in the declaration are, when data is not disaggregated by sex, it is more difficult to identify real and potential inequalities between men and women. The conflation of sex and gender identity is leading to the recording of inaccurate and misleading data used when planning for laws, policies and actions relating to stuff like employment, political participation, and maybe most crucially, violence against women. So how does the Australian census stack up in terms of uh, reliability of data collection? So this is what I found out in my delvings. Question seven is to look like this. So it gives three um, options, male, female, non-binary sex, which is an odd term, actually. I did a bit of a Google on non-binary sex. It, it really is not a, a particularly, uh, you know, it's not particularly used as a term anywhere. Go to this link for more information. Um, however, when you go to that link, um, it doesn't tell you anything. So this is the first time that the census has had non-binary sex as an option in it. They did a bit of experimenting with um, having a third option in the 2016 census, and I could tell you more about 
that if you're interested. Um, but for the moment, this is a new thing. So there's at present no information about answering question seven on the um, Australian Bureau of Statistics website. As Wurok Australia, um, we have sent a letter to the Australian Bureau of Statistics and asked what that information for question seven is to say, and we have sought assurance that the information to be given will be in accordance with the definition of sex as the physical and biological characteristics that distinguish males from females. We've received a holding reply, but we haven't received a substantive reply as yet. Uh, in that letter, we've outlined the declaration's objections to the concept of gender identity and urged them to continue to exclude this regressive concept from the census. And we've also asked that the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, include us as WUROC in their list of stakeholders for consultation about the next census. The next census after this one this year will be held in 2026 and consultations will begin in 2023. For this census, they had you know, years of preparation and years of trying out different options. Um, they had uh, eight possible new topics um, and only three got through and one of them was the inclusion of the third option uh, in the, well, what they still call the sex question, although you know, as you can see, you know, it doesn't actually have um, a heading of sex. Well, just restricting my comments here to statistics, um, if men who say they're women are included as women in stats, we've got no way of measuring, for example, how many women are put forward as candidates by political parties in winnable seats, or how many women commit sexual assaults, or, well, any number of things. Um, so what to do? Well, <laughs> um, much, I'll be saying much the same as Jack just said, of course, um, but we need to insist on common definitions of sex, female and male across all data collecting entities in this wide brown land. As the UK group Fair Play for Women rightly says, it is only through the shared meaning of words that data collection and interpretation can have any value whatsoever. Um, in the chat, I have put a link to the website of Fair Play for Women. They've done a hell of a lot of work on data collection. They recently took the, um, well, the, uh, I think it's called the ONS, the Office of National Statistics to court over the UK census and they won, um, you know, so, so there's a lot of stuff there specifically on the issue of data collection. And we need, of course, to insist on distinct definitions for sex and gender and end the conflation and ambiguity that's enshrined, positively enshrined, in the Australian government guidelines on the recognition of sex and gender, a really hopeless and pernicious document. And we need to insist, of course, on definitions of woman, man, female and male that are physical and biological. And we need to insist that sex means sex observed and registered at birth. And I would add, um, that we need to denounce gender as a bunch of sex stereotypes that have long been known to be handful to women, harmful to women. We are an oppressed people and gender is a major instrument of our oppression because it says that women are innately docile, submissive, passive, deferential, unassertive, given to washing dishes, mopping, sweeping and tidying up. We don't have a gender identity, right? That is uh, buried in the um, Australian Bureau of Statistics websites. There's a lot of um, 
things which seem to indicate that they're moving towards the idea that everybody, everybody has a gender identity. Well, we don't have a gender identity. Women are not a gender identity. We aren't cis women or cisgender. We don't collude in our own oppression. We should oppose the normalisation of the term cis and the idea that everybody has a gender identity. Now, how do we do this resistance, this insistence, this denunciation, this opposition? Well, I wish I knew, you know, um, it has to be collective. We've got to get together in groups and act as groups. And we can mount our resistance at any number of points because there are so many of them. The Australian Bureau of Statistics, for example, has recently said in response to, um, uh, you know, a, a request made by somebody, I don't think she's here tonight, but any, anyway, um, one of the activists here put in a request for the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, on their data of how many violent offenders are transsexual or transgender. But the Australian Bureau of Statistics replied that because its data are sourced from police administrative systems and police administrative systems don't include that information, they don't have any information to give her. So we could mount a campaign aimed at the police to insist that the police record that. And or we put pressure on the Australian Bureau of Statistics to intervene with the police to ensure that they do record that. And or we call for the repeal of the Australian government guidelines on the recognition of sex and gender. So I think, just think that somewhere, somewhere, somehow, something's got to give. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to send that message about the time to the whole attendees. That's all right. <laughs> okay. That's all right. But basically, that's, that's, that's what occurs to me is exactly how it plays out in bodies, in yeah. women's bodies. You know, just as I tried to my own years ago. It, it yeah. plays out in women's bodies. And you see it in the Solomon Islands where it's, it's absolutely horrific. Yeah. Uh, how women's bodies are used. Menstrual huts in the pool is another one that springs to mind. It's right, but there, it's it's just the fact that women give birth on their own, and in, in, in Solomon Islands, many places, uh, it's terrible, really. And in fact, if that is not an infringement of the law, I, I don't believe Solomon Islands are signatory to it. But in fact, that's that's what I'm talking about when I think about how this applies. Yeah. Okay. Well. On to our final question, um, back to Jake, Jack again. Uh, what are your suggestions for future directions for attendees and for the Women's Human Rights Campaign as a group? Gee, I was really hoping to um, hear more from the people who are participating at this point because I sort of feel like I've made suggestions in how to move forward, making some analysis analogies between violence against women on an individual level and what's happening on a major level. Um, I think that your ideas about actually talking about each of the, um, the sections of the sex rights declaration, doing a chapter at a time is a really good way of actually, I guess, giving us more information for each of those sections. That's pretty much all I've got to say. Yeah. yeah, and we we will be letting everyone into the room in a moment, but I'll just give each of the speakers one more go. Um, so, Eileen, you're next. Did you have any closing words on what are your suggestions for future directions um, for attendees? Um, yeah, I, I think we can't leave opposition to the trans juggernaut to conservatives. We've got to act collectively and publicly as declarationists. That's a another word I've termed, meaning signatories to the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights. How does our approach, that is the approach in the Declaration, differ from the Conservatives? Well, there are several ways, but just to concentrate on Article 1 and its concern for basic concepts and language, um, well, we voice our opposition to sex stereotypes. Conservatives often conflate sex and gender just as solidly as set trans extremists. I'm trying to get my mm. fingers up on screen, saying <laughs> sex and gender kind of stuck together. Um, conservatives think they're stuck together, and so do trans extremists. It's something they have in common. 
Um, and conservatives, for example, will bridle at, for example, a man wearing eyeliner or a floral shirt or even long hair. I think we distinguish and the, dis and the declaration distinguish itself from such an approach. Um, secondly, um, we maintain support and use the vocabulary, vocabulary reforms of second wave feminism. Um, for example, Ms. The word Ms. didn't exist. It was invented in the 70s. Um, firefighter instead of fireman. Police officer instead of policeman. Conservatives often bridle at such changes and kind of whinge about them and say it's politically. I mean, the, the, the term politically correct was pretty much invented by conservatives to cover just that kind of thing. And so I think we should make clear that we're not opposed to vocabulary changes per se, just to misogynist vocabulary changes like cis and uterus haver, the dreaded uterus haver, and pregnant person. Uh, and that we don't object to saying parent rather than mother in situations that apply or ought to apply to both sexes equally, such as packing a kid's school lunch or changing a baby's nappy. You know, if it's a thing saying, uh, you know, that could say in old time terms, you know, ask your mother to put a, an apple in your lunchbox. I don't see why we would, uh, we would object. In fact, I don't think we should object if, if they change that mother to either, you know, growing up in your household or parent or something like that in, because we are against sex role stereotyping and that differentiates us from conservatives. Which is not to say that we can't work with conservatives and applaud them when they do something for women's sex-based rights, etc. Um, our relationship to conservatives might be a discussion for another time. But I'll just say now that any alliance is stronger if the parties to it are strong in themselves. And my hope is that we as declarationists can become strong in ourselves. So I'm gonna go back to where I started from um, and say, basically, um, I, when you say I came to the United States, basically I came from the frontera in the United States. And it's like a place that's quite separate. It's on the, it's a little corner of the US Mexico, Texas, New Mexico. It's unique. And in fact, my mother was on one side of the border, other people, it was a constant flow. It was, it was a back and forth. It was a different place than it was. And it, I think it, who I was and how I came to be came a lot from that particular spot. Um, there were Hispanics, Mexican-Americans. It, it was a unique combination and a border crossings flowed all the time. And um, I grew up in a small southwestern town. I thought I was going to be a, um, you know, go to university, do whatever else. And, at a, and I thought I was smart enough. I was better than the boys, whatever else. And of course, I worked in a maternity ward as a, before I went to university, a very short time. And I was exposed to, because you could do that then, because, you know, I was a nurse aide, whatever. And I saw the most horrific gynecological butchery of the sort of stuff we still, we see today. It was back then in the 60s. It was horrific. I, and I participated in it because you didn't have any choice. You tied women down with straps. Every single one of them had, a, had, had knocked out, except for Mexican women who refused to put up with it. <laughs> they didn't. But, and then one, and I thought, oh, no, this isn't going to happen to me. And a year later, of course, I was pregnant. I had a baby and I was full of, I was in that same position myself. And that is when I realized I'm a woman. I'm a female. My, my trajectory is quite different. And I think every, than my, than my partners, and I think every woman enters it to, at a certain stage, you pick, there's something that captures you, whether it's work, whether it's uh, maternity, whether it's health, abortion, whatever, you something that says, ah, this is where I am defined by my body and I'm not going to be able to escape it. So I had five children, five pregnancies over in my lifetime, and three of them in three different countries. And in 1970, I moved to New Zealand, 1971. And with me at the same time came a wonderful book called Our Bodies, Ourselves. 
And <laughs> I had that book. It came a year after I did. It was the same thing. It was like the conversation was continued in Nelson, New Zealand, where I live. And we looked at health. We did. But the basis was it was based on personal to the political, not the individual, but the personal. And so we that's how it was formed. And it continued to be formed that way. Uh, it was a consciousness raising. There's a little book here, which I'm going to show, which is Women's Studies New Zealand, a little tiny book. I don't know if you can read it because it's not parallel, probably, but basically a New Zealand handbook. And basically it had your personal story as opposed to what was actually happening in the country, the law, the lives of New Zealand women. You could make the parallel. They weren't disconnected. And so from then on, it was a question of I did uh, courses for women, uh, developed a lot of educational programs for women, most of them at a community development or, or, or at polytechnic level, and a women's studies course with Victoria University, who were very forward thinking in having 101 in community education places. So, and from that, I went on to do national roles in New Zealand in education. And finally, I went into, uh, I was at Beijing Conference, I was a representative from a union, a teacher's union. And I then went on to do programs for uh, international development. And I did a gender and development program, but then it was WID and GAD, Women in Development and Gender and Development, a big mistake there, how those two got conflated. And, but that was a program for women sponsored by New Zealand. And then I did a number of other programs around the Pacific and in Indonesia, probably 10 years of doing international development of that sort. And I think all through all of it, what I think my, I managed those projects and I think, and, and designed them. What I think I had came from that original basis of actually being, being able to work, being interested in on the ground stuff and turning the technology or the, what we you call the methodologies, participatory into things that reflected what was happening on the ground. And that was my interest lay. And, um, and, then, re and then I left, I finally moved to, New, to, United, to Australia in 2005, and I've been there ever since. But, and I do things back and forth across from New Zealand, but mostly through online things. But my, I would say I'm a New Zealand feminist, and what does it mean? I'm interested to know what people say, with an Australian feminist or Canadian feminist or a Mexican feminist, how does, or, or a South Korean feminist. What, what are the implications? But that's where the thread, that's where my story goes. And it's also where I'm thinking about how that links in with the First Amendment, with the first, sorry, the first article, how that actually links in there, how you can make that more relevant. If you look at the first, if you look at the, at the, the document itself, if you look at what it actually says in Article 1, it's got, uh, it's any kind of impingement on the, the base of, equal, of equality of men and women, of human rights, fundamental freedoms, uh, political, economic, social, cultural, any other field. And when I look at so there's certain examples in my work in different places, and certainly in the Solomon Islands, there's one that exemplifies this perfectly. And it's the fact that in this particular place, any kind of female bodily functions, any kind of bodily functions are considered absolutely polluting. A fart, my, a friend of mine had to pay her brother money because she farted. You know, uh, women going to the toilet, women going to the toilet, walking someplace at night so they're not seen by men. Uh, their bladders go, their kidneys go. On a plane, you travel from Solomon Islands, whatever else. The men in business class say, I don't want to see any women going to the toilet. You couldn't actually put, you couldn't actually put uh, a, a subway underneath the road because, in fact, to, to uh, expedite traffic, because, in fact, a man might have, some woman might be driving across a man. And this kind of absolute objectification is pollution of women uh, by their physical bodies uh, is just, you can see it there and you can see it as it's exemplified other places, but this is so pure to me how it goes. And it's pornographied when, in the Western world. All these, all these functions turn into pornography. But in that particular context, you can just see what it is. I mean, women's bodies are absolutely the worst things that could ever happen. You cannot, they cannot identify out of it. They can't, there's nothing they can do. And there's plenty of other places where these kind of examples exist. If you look at, so, Basically, that's what, what I see in, in, the, um, in, the, in Article 1. That's what I see is basically is the body that's at work. 
and in fact, how it's actually been turned against us in so many different ways. And I think that if we're thinking about why it matters, you can go across what I think what you said, Jay, and other women say from other countries, we can actually link with those women because they have different legislation, different laws. And that's one of the ways. I'm Jay from South Korea. I'm studying nursing in here, Sydney. I've been here since last February, which means I had lots of time to think about difference between Korean feminism and Australian, like Western feminism. So I would like to tell about like some Korean story. So feminism, I think feminism based on Western culture are more likely to focus on queer or trans thing. But I don't know if it is good or not. Korea is really, really quite conservative country to discuss about queer thing. Also, the social, social discussion on women's basic human rights are not going well. That's why feminism based on Korea culture tends to tell what is misogyny and what women's rights are. So we are Korean feminists starting with why abortion shouldn't be illegal or why spy cam is illegal like this. So five years ago in Korea, there was feminism boom because of the case that woman was murdered by man at to- public toilet without no reason. At, I mean, without le- reason, any reason. So all women were pissed off and we realized like, uh, we realized how many misogyny are around us threatening our life, we are literally life. So we started to change this dirty society, making various protests, like, yeah, gathering, social gathering. And me and my friends, feminism colleagues, organized some, organized some protests about abortion, spy cam, and femicide. So especially, it was really, really meaningful because 220,000 women participated in the spy camp protest at once. So, That's and fantastic. finally, yeah, finally, yeah, yeah, right. So finally, the government made a policy about this problem. Also, the rule of this protest was only biological women can attend. So, it means Korean feminism is on the way to gender critical. I mean, the radical feminism. So I would like to introduce myself, the Korean radical feminist who loves all biological women. Sex is physical and biological characteristic that distinguish males from females. I do love this sentence. Sex is not a mental thing. Sex is not a um, related relative thing. Sex is not a subjective sub- subjective thing. Just because I feel mentally like a cat doesn't mean I can be a cat, right? Also, just because I be, I like cats toys since I was very young doesn't mean I am a cat. We women, so adult human female, are fighting a long battle against things like that violate our basic human rights, such as stereotype about female. If sex is identified with gender identity, our women rights will be further violated. For example, a man identifies himself as a woman saying he liked to play dolls and like pink color, pink color since he was very young. Then am I a man who has never liked pink without playing with the dolls? Like I have short hair, then I can be a man. It's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. So even though I have a XX chromosome, I am a biological woman, right? So gender identity sticks to social sex stereotypes. Um, I've been here in Sydney last year, from last year, since last year, February, but I've heard a lot of time, are you gay or are you wanna be transgender? Why do you have short hair like this? 
it was really, really stressful. So I hate this like gender ident identity. So not defining sex as a gender identity contributes greatly to our feminism development. The things we have to do is breaking the stereotype, not accepting gender identity. We should say like, women can have short hair. Women don't have to put makeup. We're, the, we're not people who want to be men. We're just a third human female. The strategy about this or making an online anonymous community to share this sex concept effectively. I think it is really important to create an online anonymous community where only women can participate. So, I mean, we need to gather on online with anonymous or not. So the one of the big reasons for feminism, feminism boom, the second wave of feminism in Korea was online anonymous community. The Korean women could be more honest, honest to share their stories like domestic violence or sexual harassment like this. So their stories and opinion in the community. So we could help each other and we could hear the story and say the story. So we are being invaded by men and patriarchy in our daily lives, right? So therefore we really need to need a space where biological women can unit online. So we can discuss the women's agenda there and share our daily lives as well and emphasize with each other and like build bonds. And this bond will continue through generation and have a huge impact on fostering young feminists in Australia and New Zealand as well. I think this is, is the best part to, to do future. So like, the generation is changing, changing, keep changing, but the value of feminism is not change, will not change, right? So we need to teach this value of feminism to other generation, the future generation, future girls. So we can do this in on, on online because all of girls in this generation use social social something like SNS or something. So we need to tell about gender identity is fake. We need to tell about this and we need to teach about this to them. 